Hey everyone, Sean, great to have you. Good afternoon and welcome back to Plain Speak, where we pick the brains of industry experts for a 30 minute bi-weekly chat at the intersection of technology and different facets of customer support. Today's Plain Speak guest is Sean Huberty, the VP of Customer Experience at Convoy. Sean is at the forefront of redefining the freight brokerage sector emphasizing the pivotal role of technology in streamlining processes and addressing the sector's inherent complexities, especially as it relates to satisfying polar opposite customers between shippers and drivers in Convoy's two-sided marketplace. So while it does on the surface resemble a traditional freight brokerage, Convoy is a digital player and also stands out as a virtual asset carrier. This distinctive approach enables Convoy to create a dynamic marketplace. On the one hand, connecting independent owner-operator truckers with enterprise or medium-sized shippers in a seamless manner. So additionally, the incorporation of their own trailer fleet also allows Convoy to adapt quickly based on their shipper network's demands. And what this really means is that Sean is fielding support inquiries from totally different universes of customers, let alone in an industry that's very fragmented, somewhat new to technology, and constantly in motion. So for those of you joining us for the first time at Plain Speak, my name is Liz Tai. I'm the CEO and founder of High Operator. High Operator is the leading customer support solution that scales dynamically based on a company's evolving needs. Our proprietary customer support engine, HiQ, leverages generative AI to tackle even the most complex customer requests. We also just launched an auto-tagging tool, Highlight AI, so companies can become automation ready by starting with really clean and properly tagged data. So as a quick housekeeping note, if you have questions or comments, please feel free to put them into the chat below wherever you're watching this. If we don't get to them during the session, we will reach out and post answers on LinkedIn afterwards. So Sean, hello. It is an honor to have you with us today. We're really excited to delve into the nuances of Convoy's unique approach and the ways in which technology and freight brokerage beautifully intersect under your leadership. So to kick us off, Sean, can you give us maybe just a bit of an intro on, you know, Convoy, the two sides of the marketplace and the different needs that they might have? Yeah, thanks, Liz. Pleasure to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Um, you know, compared to a traditional brokerage, Convoy sits in an interesting place. And let me just frame it first with some insights from a traditional brokerage. Uh, in, in this case, you might have someone at a brokerage who would call up a shipper and see what loads they have available. And then based on what the, that shipper says, they would then in turn call their Rolodex of carriers on file and say, who's willing to run this load for this price? Ultimately trying to find margin on both sides of the equation for the shipper. Where Convoy really differs is we take all the loads that we win from these extra large shippers and we put it into a digital marketplace and expose that for all of our carriers. And as you mentioned, our carriers are the long tail of independent owner operators. Think about uh, these as you know, people with one trucks, maybe up to 10, 15 trucks or drivers within their network. And so giving them access to this high quality freight is new. But maybe more importantly, we really operate in a spirit of full transparency on both sides. So we try and leverage our technology to make it very easy for drivers to find the load that's interesting and price competitive for them. And then using that AI and ML to, to suggest a match for that backhaul for them. Because as a driver, you want to run as few empty miles as possible. Right. That's great for the environment when you run empty miles and it ultimately means that you're willing to pay a lower price for that load. And that, that is in turn great for the shipper. And because we're using, you know, hundreds of thousands of independent owner operators, it allows us to scale up and down to meet the capacity demands of our shipper partners. Fascinating. So it really is taking what used to be a super manual process and sort of step one, digitizing it. Right. And then using that to think about the needs of both your long tail carriers, you know, your you know, people who might own just a handful of trucks and really trying to bridge that with what shippers are trying to accomplish on the other end. Exactly. Fascinating. So if we can maybe dive one level deeper into there. So I know a lot of us, even though we benefit from freight brokerages and the things we use every day, maybe don't think about all the details of what goes into that. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what are the incentives and needs and profiles that really drive shippers versus maybe drivers? 
Yeah, so first of all, uh, on the shipper side of things, people may not realize it, but it's an incredibly fragmented experience uh, that happens within a shipper entity. So first and foremost, almost all shippers tend to operate with their own sets of technology or they use third party technologies. But as they've grown, expanded, maybe grown through acquisitions, they've cobbled together this technology. And it tends to be an older set of technology versus some of the newer entrants into the market. These are hundreds of year old companies in some cases operating this way. And if you think about it from, let's just take a manufacturing shipper as an example, they may ship from one facility, which is a manufacturing site to a distribution center. And those two endpoints may operate similarly, but that same shipper, if they ship out from their distribution site to an end retailer, somewhere where a consumer would go buy th those goods and services. Yep. It may be two different systems, two different ways of operating across the two endpoints. And so it makes it very challenging to work with shippers across all the different pieces of technology. And sometimes we have shippers that really lean into technology. They wanna have sort of their concept of zero touch loads, or they wanna leverage technology to help automate scheduling as an example. Yep. You have other shippers that aren't as advanced, maybe they don't have the capabilities. And so they rely heavily on their folks within those uh, fulfillment centers to manually approve schedules, to tell folks is, is a facility running on time. And so it's a lot of back and forth interaction, it tends to be fairly asynchronous especially when you involve a driver in the equation. Fascinating. That, that does make a lot of sense, right? So, you know, shippers, you're saying if they've grown through acquisition, they have multiple systems, right? Or even rely on sort of that human touch to make it all happen. You know, so yeah. as a marketplace, you're sort of like virtualizing all this complexity, mm -hmm. right? On the shipper side, are there any strategies to try and bridge that? How do you think about that? How do you deal with that fragmentation? Yeah, for, for us at Convoy, again, I'm going to go back to that concept of transparency. Yeah. So we leverage our technology to try and make it really easy for a shipper to see what's happening with a load that Convoy is running at any point in time. So we have our shipper facing website. They can go see, you know, with 30 or sorry, with three minute heartbeat pings from our app where a driver is. We can give them ETAs. We can share facility insights and driver insights about what it's like to go work at, or you know, to pick up a load in Dallas, Texas for some particular shipper, right? And we in turn share that feedback with our drivers. And yep. you can start to see that a driver is going to give ratings on certain facilities. They know that it's really difficult to get into a facility or maybe a facility is always loading behind. Ultimately, that impacts the price that a driver is going to bid. And being able to share those insights back with the shippers is really, really powerful to them. So they understand, you know, both how is Convoy performing, but what is the impact of their own operations having on their cost structure in the efficiency of their overall network? And so those are a couple of examples where we really try and leverage technology to help our shippers perform better and understand what's happening. That's so fascinating. So I think what I just heard was you, that transparency then drives driver behavior and driver's ability to bid on loads. And then that actually then becomes sort of quantifiable feedback that can go back to the shippers and drive changes internally on their org. Super, yeah. super cool. Um, which actually I think bridges us over to sort of technology on the carrier side. And I know you and I, last time we talked a lot about strides that Convoy has made with its app. Can you tell us a little bit about that significance and the impact on the operational efficiency on the driver's side and maybe um, innovations that have driven that? Yeah, so I'm gonna maybe take you back to the beginning of Convoy. So around 2015, and there was sort of a big event happening in the mobile phone industry, which was, it was the first time people were able to kind of get regular upgrades into smartphones. And at the time, our founders made a choice that they were gonna center everything around having, with a driver having an app. And this concept of an app in the cab has turned out to be incredibly powerful, both for the drivers, but also for Convoy. So first and foremost, from a driver perspective, this is a place where they go and search for all of their loads, where they can book their backhauls. It's where they can you know, take pictures of the bill of lading, how they can quickly upload that, how they can get paid more quickly. And we give them benefits, like we pay our drivers within two days. If they want even faster for a nominal fee, that can be accommodated. But we, we truly try and make it easy for the drivers to do everything they need to do within the app. 
Maybe another example is let's say they're driving and they get a flat tire. Just through the app, they can tell us, hey, it looks like I'm going to be delayed. I have a flat tire. Can you help me readjust my delivery appointment? Right. Yes. So again, everything flows through there. And then from the convoy perspective, uh, what we try and do is we ask our drivers to keep their location tracking on as, as one example, right? This gives us heartbeat information as to where a driver is either headed for a pickup or once they have a load and where they're going to, to delivery. And then we use AI and ML models to help predict ETA, to take traffic patterns, you know, things like that. And then we in turn share that with our driver or we use those insights to figure out where does someone need to manually intervene when we get data signals through that. And so it really tends to benefit both sides of the marketplace, leveraging that technology. Absolutely. Because I know we started off talking about the shipper benefits, right? They get predictability, they get insights, they know when something's going to arrive. But I think what you just said here was that it's actually on a very personal level, super helpful for the drivers because if they're in the middle of nowhere, they've got a flat tire. You know, for those of us who aren't as familiar with trucking, Sean, yeah. Bring us back 10 years. What would a driver be doing? Would they be picking up a phone? Like what, what did that experience look like where they could open their app and click a button? Yeah. So it, depending on how far you want to go back, right? Before cell phones, they would have to pull over to a pay phone to or a truck stop, whatever, and give an update, right? Once cell phones were in the, or they were, you know, CBing back and forth to a dispatcher or trying to connect with people that way to figure out where people are, what's going on. You know, many times you would have a shipper calling them saying, hey, you know, Liz, where are you on this load? Are you, do you think you're going to make it in time? This is a really important load for me. So a lot of back and forth with drivers. This way, we've sort of taken a lot of that friction away from them and simplified their experience. Makes a ton of sense. Now, to think a little bit about maybe the specifics of call it customer support for, you know, the freight brokerage marketplace industry, you know, we at High Operator, at least, we think a lot about different workflows, right? And a company is going to have specific workflows because in a sense, customer support is what steps in when things go wrong, right? Now, for a lot of things like maybe e-commerce companies, you can sort of predict what the top six or seven workflows are because there's a constrained universe of things that a customer can really do when they go and order something on a Shopify site. Yeah. Freight bro trucking strikes me as a lot messier. How do you sort of take that mess and consolidate it and think about how you're going to train and support and build supporting workflows? Yeah, great, great question there. So I, I think there's there's two sides of it here. So as you suggested, in a normal consumer application, there's a couple of ways of doing things, but it's easier to automate to create workflows that are very standard and consistent. And for parts of shipping, that is true. And we really try and lean into that automation. So at Convoy, you know, as an example, we ask all of our drivers at the end of the load, take a picture of the bill of lading. Yes, a piece of paper that still exists within the industry. It hasn't been digitized yet, but take a picture of that piece of paper, upload that. Like that is in turn what we need to be able to bill the shipper for that work. And that is the signal that triggers a driver getting paid. Right. And so we try and automate workflows, make it very simple and consistent and repeatable for our drivers to go through that process. And like that would be an example of sort of a a high volume, similar transaction type where yeah. it's, it's the same no matter who you are uh, within that workflow. Other times it's very bespoke shipper to shipper. Like, how does a shipper want to handle a reschedule? Are we allowed as the carrier or the broker to go in and just reschedule if we see an available time? Or do I need to contact the drop-off facility and say, what, what kind of times can you accommodate? If you approve this time, you know, based on the predicted transit time, you know, then I need to go back and communicate with the driver. And so we will try and automate, let's say we have a new confirmation of a drop-off time, we'll automate that right back into the driver app so they know they will have a new drop-off time. Maybe they'll just get a quick text that says, your drive, your, it looks like you're running late, your drop-off time has been adjusted one hour later, as an example, right? Or we will use signals um, through our data detection that tells us, looks like something's going wrong, you know, I may need to reach out to a carrier to understand what's going on, or it looks like this facility is loading behind. Can I reach out to that shipper to understand what's going 
to understand if I need to then go update my drop off time. And so we really think about it as using technology to inform our CX associates, when should you intervene and what are the next best suggested actions? Or on the converse in the high volume scenarios, we really use it to try and create streamlined, automated, as efficient of a workflow as possible. Again, centered around our customers and what they're trying to achieve. Absolutely. So sounds like what I'm hearing here is, you know, it's, there's really no magic bullet until someone decides to solve general AI. There's really no magic bullet of, hey, here is the automated solution, right? It's this orchestration of, hey, almost a process optimization process of where is that low hanging fruit? What's really repeatable? What can we automate? And then beyond that, a lot of instrumentation, right? Of where can we put in really in a sense, all these little sensors throughout the process to look for signals that say, hey, this is where it requires a little bit more information. This is where we go from there. Yeah. So, and, and yeah. Maybe I'll expand just a little bit more on something that's been in the news this week. Um, it's called the Scheduling Standard Consortium. So we have folks from Convoy, from JB Hunt, from Uber Freight, from Open Network, who's one of the largest TMSs. And we've really put together a standard and an architectural diagram for how we think an industry standard around scheduling could be done. And as we get more folks to buy into this, to adopt these, that you know, that there's several hundred TMS providers out there in the marketplace. If folks were to adopt a, a more singular standard, mm -hmm. it would really help drive scale and efficiency and data that's going to enable you know, both sides of that marketplace to leverage that technology to reduce waste, to create automation, to create more transparency and information symmetry. Interesting, a single scheduling standard, because this sort of takes us back to what you said at the beginning, right, where shippers, they might have multiple facilities, divisions that they've cobbled together through M&A. And what that means is that sometimes with a fully automated system, there's really great clean data available that you can tap into about things like scheduling, loads, on time, delays, things like that. But then you have a lot of, maybe, I don't know if it's a lot, there's some, some body of shippers who don't have any of that. So the only way to get that is to pick up the phone and call someone, right? Yeah, or, or think about the example of going from a manufacturing distribution center to a retailer, right? Those are two separate companies. They may be operating on completely different uh, TMSs or transportation management systems. And in that case, having a singular standard where data can flow more seamlessly and have the same definition and talk to each other really makes a huge difference across the industry, right? And if you think about all of the carriers, all of the other providers, just being able to write code toward a single standard creates a ton of scale and efficiency. Yeah, I mean, it's just API standards for scheduling, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, because I think step one, we think about this a lot just in a broader sort of customer support, maybe more consumer marketplace is before we can really talk about automation. Step one is really standardization, right? Mm -hmm. You get all the data standardized in the same units in the same virtual plane before you can start doing some of the really cool data stuff. Now, Convoy is in a really cool spot because you because as a marketplace, you own a lot of that two sided information. But yeah, the idea of a scheduling standard that delivers more of that in real time from all parties sounds super, super impactful. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, this is driven by, you know, many of our competitors, if you will, also providers uh, just within the TMS space. So I think it's a really good example of collaboration across the industry that's going to benefit everyone. Definitely. Yeah, it it's, sounds like it's something that the industry is definitely looking for to some extent. Um, so, you know, when we think about marketplaces, to sort of um, branch off a little about marketplaces, yeah. we work with a lot of consumer marketplaces. And in every consumer marketplace, there's usually some sense of asymmetry between the two sides of that. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what the dynamics of supply versus demand are in the trucking industry? And then since we're heading to Q4 for many of our listeners, listeners here, does that shift and change throughout the year? And then how does that then impact the needs of shippers and carriers? And then how does that sort of drive through to the support world? Yeah, um, a couple of places to start on this, right? So if you, if you wanna go back to like 2019 and what was very much in the news was the shortage of truck drivers as the pandemic started 
And I think a couple of things happened there. One, people really ramped up their e-commerce purchases because they had to, because they couldn't go to physical stores as much. So it put much more demand on either um, you know, inbound freight from overseas, long haul trucking, short haul trucking, last mile delivery as well. Right. We yeah. also had the factor where a lot of jobs were put on pause because they weren't deemed critical or, or necessary. And so what you saw was a lot of people um, switch jobs and become a truck driver. Hmm. And you also saw an increased demand in shipment volume or forecasts. Right. And so yeah. there's sort of a, a boom within trucking of people joining the marketplace um, as well as the demand uh, soaring. As we've come off the pandemic here, we've seen a couple of things happen. We've moved more into recessionary times. We've seen retail inventories and in particular wholesale inventories kind of amp up to you know, a, a high point within their life cycle, but you still have this oversupply of drivers, if you will. And so you're starting to see more and more drivers sort of exit that marketplace a little bit. And you've also seen fuel costs rise, especially with um, you know, the Russia, Ukraine, situation, right? And so all of that puts an impact on supply and demand into the overall trucking marketplace and causes equilibrium and, and you, you see that flow up and down. But I, I think another way to look at this is uh, when, like from a convoy perspective, we really want to make sure that we can have more and more loads within our marketplace in the concept of building density for a particular market or region is important because when we have a density of loads in a particular region, it means that any drivers within that area or who want to move in and out of that area can almost always find a load that fits their needs. And when drivers keep coming back into that marketplace, it means we are and loads are at a high volume it means people are finding front haul and back haul uh, trips it means that you're reducing empty miles you're lowering costs into the system you're better for the economy because you're reducing waste and ultimately that tends to drive um, greater price efficiency for the shipper partners so it's really a win-win-win when we find that density within the marketplace and we have drivers coming back into that repeated flywheel makes sense, right? More drivers getting more loads on both directions, driving overall cheaper prices for the shippers, driving more usage, and that's sort of the magic that you look for in a marketplace. Exactly. Um, fascinating. You know, maybe just to sort of zoom out of overall a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, when you think about customer experience, either, you know, within or outside of logistics, what do you think is the future there? And I know we talked a little bit about all the various ways in which AI and automation maybe aren't front and center, but support all that experience. You know, what are some of the things that you're sort of looking forward to there? Yeah, I, I think about it in a, a couple of ways. I think there are uh, really good scenarios where almost the entirety of the solve can be automated through AI or through very streamlined interactions with AI. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll go back to sort of a, a previous industry I was in and travel, you know, the, I used to have to phone up if I wanted to make a change to a reservation on an airline or cancel a hotel booking. Now it's very easy to automate that, go through sort of a, you know, an AI chat solution and cancel my booking, reschedule it for an another day, do whatever. So to me, those are great examples where you can leverage technology almost end to end for the solve. And then I think there's a second set of scenarios that are more complicated, where ultimately you want human judgment involved to make the final decision. But in those cases, can you gather information? Can you streamline the process flow? Can you just make it easier and easier for a person to get to that right decision that's that's going to help your, your end customer? And I, I think both of those are incredibly powerful, but I, I don't think they that, that people should think it's entirely one or the other. I think you really have to, to keep your customer in mind, understand what they're trying to solve and design the technology around that, that customer solution, right? Um, just to give you a totally different example, like if you go back 10, 15 years, like the concept of mobile banking, it really wasn't that convenient uh, for a consumer. You still had to go into the bank for some things now, 
if I ever even get a check anymore, the ability for me to just take a picture and deposit it all in my mobile app is so seamless. Like I can't imagine going into the bank for something as silly as that. And like that's credit to the designers who have really made it a convenient, simple, easy workflow that solved the needs as me as a customer. Yeah, absolutely. Because at the end of the day, what we try and keep in mind as well is that the end customer doesn't necessarily care about how much automation, AI, or anything else is behind the scenes, right? They want to deposit their checks, have their loads arrive, know where they're going for the next load. And it really is a question of how you design everything behind the scenes to get to that perspective. Yeah. Um, I think we we'll take one quick question from the audience, actually, if that's okay. Yeah. And the idea is, you know, there's this future, right, of automation, driving everything in perfect synchronization, orchestrated with experts in the loop. But as you brought up earlier, one step towards this is that scheduling standard. And David Minkus from our audience is saying, are you facing any resistance to the idea of standardization in your industry? And if so, maybe what are some reasons and for the pushback and ways to address that? Um, yes. Yeah, so the answer is definitely yes. Uh, and, and I think it, it kind of comes down to who you ask and who has decision making capabilities within some of these companies. Uh, one, like there could be a high cost of engineering to conform to a new set of standards. Right. And so you may have your IT professional decision maker who's like, hey, I like the idea, but it's so expensive. I can't fit it in my roadmap. You have a timing element of it there. Um, I, I think the, the other angle is like, there is a bunch of, I'm going to, you know, it, it, uh, work that is fairly manual that happens at shipping facilities, right? And there's an element of job protectionism that still happens within the industry of, yeah, yes, I, I, in an example would be, I can go into a TMS and I can see that the eight o'clock appointment time is available, like, Theoretically, I could book that with technology, but many times there's an element of, no, Sean, you can't book that because Sally needs to approve that in order for you to have that time slot. And so I, I think it, it takes a mentality of how do we eliminate waste? How do we create a more seamless transportation network in order to, for folks to really lean into that standardization? Absolutely. Yeah, but and you're right, right? Thinking about sort of the human aspect of the changes is actually really important, right? So I think the future is something that we're all really excited about, which is, hey, you have humans in the loop really providing sort of higher level expert care and not doing a ton of busy work, but it's really sort of providing that bridge from today, right, where that is all that they do to that future where they have a more interesting role that I think is going to be interesting across many, many industries over the next probably, you know, five to 10 years or so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Awesome. Um, I know we've just got a couple of questions here left, Sean. Um, so each week we do a rolling question. Mm -hmm. Yours is coming from Brett Fraser, a customer service operations expert who is most recently a consultant at Arise in a Sun Basket. And he'd like to know, you know, what advice would you give to a first time customer service manager as they think about the future of how generative AI is going to impact their work? Yeah, um, maybe I have two parts to this answer for, for Brett. Um, first and foremost, I think it's it's critically important that you start with a customer as you're designing whatever solution uh, you're going to come up with. And, and as you leverage more and more technology, you can see applications in our regular life where some people really think about the customer and how simple it's going to be for them. And others take the approach of, I just wanna eliminate cost from my operation side. And so maybe they don't design quite the same customer experience into that. So I would, I would for sure encourage anyone to uh, really think through the customer experience of what they're creating. And, and maybe the second thought is for folks to embrace the idea of technology and to explore it. Many times it's really easy to rely on, this is comfortable for me, this is what we've always done, this is what the industry has always done, and just to hang on to that practice. But I encourage people to really be open to kick the tires on different sets of technology on what, what is really possible, because I, I think there's so much advancement that's happened in the last couple of years and is going to continue to happen that is really exciting for what that means. And, um, you know, maybe just to give an example, 
the language translation capabilities mm. through asynchronous conversations has just like boomed in the past couple of years. And I think that's really incredible as you run a global operation, you know, maybe you're having people who don't speak the same language be able to help each other. Like that's incredibly powerful in the industry and something that didn't exist a few years ago to this extent. And so to me, it's a great example of where technology benefits both consumer and um, you know, the, the operator. Absolutely. Right. The, the, I think the question of what is possible is really evolving every day. And maybe there's a sci-fi future where we translate voice in real time and really speak to each other. Um, and then question for you, Sean, what question would you like to ask our next guest? Yeah. My, my question for the next guest is what advice would they have for, CS managers who are facing resistance or people who are fearful of sort of job loss or job impact uh, to their teams and how are they rolling out technology Absolutely. And, and the change there, yeah. The human factors design. Well, I am excited to see what our next guest has to say about that. Um, Sean, thank you so, so much for joining us over lunch today. And thanks to everyone who is able to tune in today and spend a little bit of time with us. If you have any customer support questions, please reach out to yourselves or to Sean. And do come join us for a spicy rendition of Plain Speak in two weeks, Wednesday, October 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern, where we'll be chatting with Emilio Morales Paredes, who is most recently at field about how their alternative dating app allows anyone to date curiously and also how to train customer support teams for highly sensitive personal and emotional concerns. Sean, thank you so much. Really, thank really you. spending time with us today. All right.